Don't you tell somebody he's awesome. Provider. Yeah. Provider. Defender. Defender. Master. Master of the universe. You know you me. Know me. You are an awesome wonder. Provider. Provider. Defender. Defender. Master. Master of the universe. You know me, Maui. You are an awesome wonder. Say it again, provider, defender, master. Master of the universe. You know me. You are. You are an awesome wonder. Can you say? Heavenly Father, we just pause to magnify, glorify, and exalt your name. We just thank you, O oh dear God, for being our God and for saving us, O oh God, and calling us, O oh God, out of darkness into your marvelous light. Father, thank you for teaching us, O oh God, to see each other as you see us, to love our neighbors as ourselves, Lord God. Thank you for every gift that you have given to the body, Lord God. And thank you that all those gifts work together for the perfecting of the saints, Lord God. Teach us, O oh God, then, how to use every one of the gifts that you have given, O oh God, to bring about unity in our communities, Lord God, in our churches and in our, in our spaces, Lord God. Help us, O oh God, to be exactly who you have called us to be in the earth. O oh God, and to glorify your name, that is our prayer. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 33 and 37 to 47. And it reads as follows. This Jesus God raised up. We are all witnesses to this fact. He was exalted to God's right side and received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He poured out the Spirit and you are seeing and hearing the results of his having done so. When the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled. They said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. With many other words, he testified to them and encouraged them, saying, be saved from the perverse generation. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 into the community on that day. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They were sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute their proceeds to 
everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. May you all be blessed by the word. Greetings. The last Sunday in September uh, of this unit, September 26, 21 uh, of, of this quarter, the fall quarter, celebrating unity as we continue on this overall theme of celebrating God. Acts 2, 32 through 33, 37 through 47. Uh, celebrations bring about unity and a new way of seeing and being in the world. How can our celebrations unify a divided community in the world? The first Christian community who heard the gospel was inspired by the Holy Spirit to see the world differently and united to live, worship, and evangelize together. The goal of the lesson to understand Jesus' forgiveness of sins and role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the life of the church. To discern how the love of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit inspire believers of different backgrounds to share life, worship, care, and witness. To plan opportunities for persons to encounter the Holy Spirit and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ through the ministries of your church. Uh, in the first uh, verses of this text, 32 through 33, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, this God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Jesus of Nazareth, the man that they all knew, as you ourselves also know, in Acts 2.22, was the one who fulfilled the prophetic Psalm 16. How did Peter know this? He saw the resurrected Jesus. Peter's sermon, this is part of Peter's sermon, sort of the, re the response in Peter's sermon. The basic evidence of the resurrection was simply the report of the reliable eyewitness, of which we are all eyewitnesses, the scripture says. He poured out with each you now see what the, this which you now see and hear talking about the Holy Spirit. Peter affirms that what the crowd saw was the work of the risen and ascended Jesus who has sent the Holy Spirit upon the church. The response to Peter's preaching in verses 37 through 47, they respond with the question, what shall we do? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? Now when they heard this, what shall we do? This was the obvious, a significant work of the Holy Spirit. The great crowd listening to Peter was deeply moved by Peter's bold proclamation of the truth. They asked Peter how they should respond. It is wrong to think that Peter offered no kind of invitation or challenge for his listeners to respond. Uh, Acts 2.40 says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Peter clearly did exhort them to respond and invited his listeners to be saved. Nevertheless, the multitude responded with remarkable initiative. The response of the crowd also helps us to put the evening of that day of Pentecost into perspective. The exercise of the gift of the tongues produced a nothing in the listeners except for astonishment and mocking. It wasn't until the gospel was preached that the conviction from the Holy Spirit came. Uh, this was the work of God, and the work of God that God really wanted to accomplish. This is a good day of describing, cut to the heart. It is a good way of describing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they now knew they were responsible for the death of Jesus as each of us are, and that they had to do something in response uh, as part of their responsibility. Peter had some previous experience with cutting to the heart. When, uh, when Jesus was arrested, Peter cut off the right ear, one of the men who came to arrest Jesus in John 18.10. All of this was the embarrassing mess that Jesus had to clean up. That showed Peter in the flesh doing the best he could with a literal sword of human power. When the resurrected Jesus changed Peter's life, and when the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon him, he did some much more effective cutting. Cutting hearts, opening them to Jesus. This is what Peter could do in the power of the Spirit. Doing God's best with the sword of the Spirit. Word, God's word. Which sword was more powerful than the sword that cut off the person's ear. 
What shall we do? When God is working on someone's heart, they want to come to God. They will want to act to come to God. It has been said that in normal seasons of Christian work, the evangelist seeks the sinner. Yet in times of revival or awakening, things change. The sinner seeks the evangelist. This day of Pentecost in Acts 2 was one of the greatest seasons of God's work. In 38, verses 38 through 40, Peter invites the multitude to come to Jesus. And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Responding to the question, what shall we do? Peter gave them something uh, to do. This means we must do something to be saved. We, we must do something to follow Jesus. It just doesn't happen. Peter did not say there's nothing you can do. If God saves you, you're saved. If God doesn't save you, you've never been saved. Although it was true that only God could do the saving, an important point. The people had to receive through repentance and faith, faith leading to action such as baptism. The first thing, repent, told them, Peter told them to do is repent. To repent does not mean to feel sorry, but it means to change one's mind and direction. They had thought a certain way about Jesus before, considering him worthy of crucifixion. Now they must turn their thinking around, embracing Jesus as Lord and Messiah. Repent sounds much like a, such a harsh word in the mouths of many preachers and the ears of many listeners, but it is an essential aspect of the gospel. Repent has been rightly called the first word of the gospel. When John the Baptist preached, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew 3, 2. When Jesus began to preach, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. Now when Peter began to preach, he started with repent. Repentance must never be thought of something we must do before we can get back to God. Remember this. Repentance describes what's come, what coming to God is. You can't turn towards God without turning from the things God is against. And so repent is a turning towards God and turning away from things that God is against. In this sense, repent is a word of grace. Hope. It says you don't, you don't have to continue the way you are. There's hope. The old-fashioned grace of repentance is not to be dispensed with. There must be sorrow for sin. There must be a broken and contrite heart. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Peter says. This was the second thing Peter said that we must do. For them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ was an expression of their belief and complete trust in Jesus. Baptism made a clear statement. In, in that day, Jews were not commonly baptized, only Gentiles who wanted to become Jews. For these Jewish men and women to be baptized showed how strongly they felt they needed Jesus. The promise is to you and your children and to all are for all. As the repented and demonstrated faith and obedience by baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit will be given to them as it was given to the original group of disciples. Peter also specifically promised that the promise of the Holy Spirit will be given to those who believe in all the succeeding generation. All who are afar off. That may just inc that includes us. They saw the glorious work of the Holy Spirit among the disciples, and Peter told them that it was something that these people could take part in. They didn't only have to be observers, and since the promise is for all who are far off, it includes all people, even up to this 21st century. It is also important to note that Peter did not say that the unbelieving, unaware children of his listeners should be, be baptized. He simply said that it is the promise of the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit where all who repent and believe with active faith, even in coming in generations, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. That is, that is to say, that great covenant promise, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, is meant for you, is meant for your children, is meant for everyone, is meant for anybody. That's what it is addressed to. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. Peter's sermon didn't end there. He continued to urge the crowd to come to Jesus and repentant surrender. He, he be saved from this first generation, perverse generation. Any generation that is responsible for putting Jesus to death is a perverse generation. But since every generation is responsible for Jesus' death, 
Every generation needs salvation. Important to hear that. Don't blame it just on those early Jews. Blame it and on all of us. We are responsible for in every generation and therefore we need salvation. The response. This is the great part of this, of this sermon to me is the response. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized and that day 3,000 souls were added to them. About 3,000. The day of Pentecost saw the amazing harvest of souls. The church went from about 120 people to 3,120 people in one day. Those who <coughs> gladly received the word were baptized. Those who believed on Jesus and did so even making a dramatic statement in baptism. Uh, they were, unless they were fully convinced, they were not submitted to baptism and Jesus and that was the great need for them as their savior. How could you baptize 3,000 people? There were huge resources of water available in the Temple Mount and pools and reservoirs nearby. So it was not difficult to find a place where the baptisms could take place. The life of these first believers. Uh, this is where I sort of hinge a lot of my teaching about discipleship is around this idea in 42 through 47. The foundation of their Christian life. And they continue, listen to this, they were not just baptized, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. On the day of Pentecost, the sound of the Russian wind, the tongues of fire, the conversion of 3,000 were all remarkable events, but the things described in Acts 42, 42 were the abiding legacy of God's word. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They relied on the apostles to communicate to them who Jesus was and what Jesus had done. They just trusted in Jesus. Now they wanted to know more about Jesus. They continued steadfastly, uses a Greek verb, communicating a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. There was to be no departure from the apostles' doctrine because it was the truth of God. Thankfully, God allows us to sit under the Apostles' Doctrine, the New Testament record. Every pastor should seek the unoriginal in the sense, to be unoriginal in this sense, that we don't have our own doctrine, but the Apostles' Doctrine. They continue in steadfastly in fellowship. The ancient Greek word koinonia, uh, translated here in, as fellowship, has the idea of association, communion, fellowship, and participation. It means to share in something. The Christian life is meant to be a full fellowship of sharing with one another. We, sit, we share the same Lord Jesus. We share the same guide for life. We share the same love for God. We share the same desire to worship God. We share the same struggles. We share the same victories. We share the same job of living for God. We share the same joy of communicating the gospel. Then they continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. Even living so close to the time when Jesus was crucified, they still never wanted to forget what he did on the cross. How much more important it is for us today to never forget. Then they continued steadfastly in prayers. Wherever God's work is done, God's people gather for prayer and worship. In the Greek, the definite art article occurs before the word prayer. The text actually says, to the prayers. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Obviously, that is a reference to something formal, to worship, in which the people got together and praised God. The apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Everything else we read about the power and glory of the early church flows from this foundation of the word fellowship, remembrance of God's work on the cross, and prayer. From Luke's description of the early Christian community, the educated reader would have not would have, would have got the impression that here that the Greek ideal of society had been realized. It is presented as a model church, but this does not mean it was perfect by any means. A few chapters later, we will see for ourselves that that is not perfect. The presence, in verse 43, the presence of the power of God. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. 
This was the evidence of the power of God. One of the great, greatest and most powerful works God can do is chain the human heart. A reverent honor to a reverent honor of the Lord. Many signs and wonders were done. This was the evidence of the power of God. Where God is at work, lives will be touched in, in miraculous ways. And then in verses 44 through 35, the closed hearts and sharing in the common life of Jesus. All, all who were together and had all, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among themselves. With as they needed, as need was there. With the influx of more than 3,000 believers, most of whom stayed in Jerusalem and didn't have jobs, the family of Christians had to share if they were to survive. We should regard this as an early experiment in communism because it was voluntary, it was temporary, and flawed in the extent that it, the church in Jerusalem was in continual need of financial support from other churches. Also, we don't have any evidence this continued very long. All who believed were together. The Jews had a tremendous custom of hospitality. During any major feast like Pentecost, visitors were received into private homes and no one could charge for giving a bed or a room to a visitor and supplying their basic needs. The Christians took this tremendous feast time hospitality and made it an everyday thing. They sold their possessions and their goods and invited them. The power of God is evident here because Jesus became much more important to them than their, than their possessions. And then this lesson ends on from verses 46 through 47. The Christian family lived together and grew. And listen to these last verses. As it said, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity. Uh, uh, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Uh, the church is meant to worship God and learn from God's word together. Yet it is meant to do more. God wants us to share our lives with one another. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Their Christian experience was daily, joyful, and simple. Good examples for us today. And the Lord as the last verse says, the last sentence in this lesson, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. This is God's prescription for church growth. If we take care to follow the example of Acts 2, 42 through 47, 8, God will take care of growing the church in God's self. That's our lesson for today. Celebrate in unity from Acts 2, the verses, selected verses from Acts 2. Blessings to you all as I commend the challenges to you on the next slide. We want you more than anything. Come on, don't stop your worship. We want you to learn Jesus.